Okay, we still don't see Councillor Taylor, but I'm going to go ahead and get started with uh, the Iowa City City Council regular meeting for June 16th, 2020. Roll call, please. And Burgess. we may have roll call, please. Burgess. Here. Mims. Here. Philly. Yeah. Taylor. Teague. I can hear Kelly. Teague. We can hear her, Bruce. We can hear. Oh, I can't hear anybody. That's one second. Problematic. <laughs> now I think I can. Okay. Teague. Here. Thomas. Here. Weiner. Here. All right. Well, sorry about the technical challenges here starting out, and hopefully we will be able to move on with very few. Welcome to everybody that is joining us uh, here at Iowa City. And typically our meetings are, are at 7 p.m. for formal meetings such as this, but uh, this one is at 5 p.m. today. We do have another one tonight at 7 p.m. And that'll be a one item agenda that will be related to, um, the, the item on that agenda is going to be related to Black Lives Matter movement, systemic racism and police policies um and also um so that'll be happening at 7 p.m tonight so this meeting have a full agenda but that item is going to be at 7 p.m could i get a motion to approve consent calendar well actually we're going to go to items number two through seven um and can i get a motion to approve the consent calendar as amended moved by Sally. Seconded Weiner. Okay, anyone in the public would like to address anything that is on our consent calendar? If you do, um, there is a raise hand button um, at the bottom of your screen and I will call your name. And if you're on the phone, um, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Seeing no one, council discussion. I just have a couple things just really quick um, on 3A. This is from the CPRB minutes. Um, want to express appreciation for some adjustment. It looks like in one of the standard operating guidelines that regards the use of social, social media in investigations. We had an issue <laughs> Um, earlier in the spring that there was some, some concern about. So evidently the CPRB has looked at that and discussed that with police and made some adjustments. So I was glad to see that. And then 5A, uh, the calling of the lease early on the Harrison Street parking ramp. That's something that we've talked about in terms of um, giving us some flexibility with some budgeting and moving some money. But um, I think if you look at like the last paragraph of that memo, it's really important for all of us to keep in mind that there's still um, significant financial issues in the parking fund um, due to the COVID-19. So um, thank you to Dennis and others on, you know, and, and Jeff and everybody on looking at that, um, getting rid of that lease early, but we still have some major financial issues there that we need to keep in mind. So just those two items, thank you. Anyone else? And I do see Councillor Taylor has joined us. Welcome. All right. If no further discussion, roll call, please. And Burgess. unmute your phones or your tablets. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Taylor? Yes. Sorry. Technical difficulties. T? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Moving on to item number eight, which is our community comment opportunity for anyone in our, um, that is here that would like to address council on any item that is not on our agenda. And if I see two hands raised, I'm gonna call you um, in order 
that I see them on my screen. So Nicholas Thiessen, followed by Anthony. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillors, for letting me speak again this evening. Um, as always, I'm going to get back on my hobby horse of affordable housing and Council's generally lackadaisical approach to the housing issues in Iowa City. Um, I ran over a little bit last time, so I just want to leave you with a thought, since it's related to another item on your agenda, although I don't want to speak to that item, it's just related. So I've been communicating with uh, Tracy Haichu, who, by the way, I'd like to commend. She is a wonderful person, especially since um, her boss decided to um, ignore my questions and have her answer them instead, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Again and again, I keep hearing the number a million dollars, a million dollars. It sounds like a lot of money. The city is spending a million dollars on affordable housing. A million dollars is not a lot of money, especially when it comes to housing. I mean, when you consider the fact that the median home price in Iowa City is over $200,000, that's not even five homes, not even five homes. And then when you consider the fact that the city basically gives away 70% of that money to another organization, a perfectly fine organization, it means that the city itself actually isn't really doing that much. And in relation to item later on the agenda, <laughs> the city is currently thinking about spending $1.23 million to move a house, one house, an old house, a very nice house, again, a fine project, but you're not even spending as much on the totality of housing as you are on moving an old house from one location to another. So I'd like you to keep that in the back of your minds as you keep bringing up affordable housing in other contexts, because honestly, I'm just gonna keep saying it. You're not doing enough. The magnitude of the crisis is huge. You have the resources to deal with it. So please get off your tuchises and do something about it. And that's it. That's all I have to say for tonight. Thank you. You want to mute, Mayor? Thank you, Nicholas. We'll have Anthony, followed by Susanna. Hi, um, this is Anthony. Um, Kelly Froling um, has uh, materials that I, I sent to them. Um, if they are able to screen share those. Okay, are you able to see that? No. No, let me move it here. Now? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. I should be able to share and I've got screen. All right, I think it's starting. Mm-hmm. I've been speaking to a few um, community members um, about um, different uh, legislative priorities they had. Um, and something that got brought up was uh, ballot initiatives and a referendum. Um, so I've been speaking with um, the city clerk uh, for a few days now, who has been very, very helpful in figuring this process out um, because uh, there are only five um, cities in Iowa with charters that allow for ballot referendum. Uh, and we did come to um, a, a finding which I wanted to bring to city council's attention to help resolve. Um, on the right here, you can see where uh, ballot petitions and referendum are, or sorry, ballot uh, initiatives and referendums are outlined in the city charter. It's under section 7.05, um, specifically under B, submission to voters. The, the first item says that the vote of the city on a proposed measure should be held at the regular city election or at the general election, which next occurs more than four days after. Um, and then there's, there's a period which is elaborated on previously in that section. So uh, from a regular reading that we saw from this, it seemed that uh, the purpose of this was that initiatives would be able to be voted on by Iowa City um, electors um, every year, every general election. So November of insert year here. However, a bill passed last year. Um, let me just pull out what exact number that was. Uh, House file 692 in 2019 passed um, has a measure that says for a city um, in an odd number year, the first Tuesday or the second Tuesday in September or the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, 
that is for ballot initiatives. So essentially there was a preemption um, that now uh, makes it so Iowa City could only vote on ballot referendums and initiatives every two years during regularly scheduled city elections. Uh, under the current charter, you could not actually have any um, general election. So 2020, 2022, 2024 um, ballot referendum. Um, it seemed to me that this uh, was unexpected um, and not the original intent of the charter. So I wanted to bring that up through um, whichever um, uh, amendment process the Iowa City has for adjusting its charter and, and would recommend um, trying to put in some language so that if any bill in the future did change the timeline, um, hopefully it could it could fix it so uh, this problem doesn't come around again. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And yep, so thank you, Nicholas. And now we will have Susanna. And you're on mute. There you go. Okay. All right. I'm so sorry. This is really the first time I've been involved. And I um, I did vote, though, for a lot of you that are sitting there. And it's so good to see you. Um, I um, feel like I'm a little tardy in, in bringing this up. But um, it was brought to my attention that there um, is money that's been an um, that may be available for um, helping combat the coronavirus. And, and I would just like to strongly suggest uh, some of it being used for um, masks as well as shields. Um, and it kind of can be seen as part of the seven o'clock meeting, but I just think health wise, um, how, just wondering how we can make it available to people uh, somehow. I'm not exactly sure on all the, the thoughts on that, but I just think it would help um, just most, most uh, us people, uh, sorry, uh, those of us that are uh, soon to be 65 or older, um, be able to be more involved too um, in what's happening in our community and feel better about being out and being able to talk freely with people. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address council? Seeing no hands raised. We will move on to item number nine, planning and zoning matters. 9A rezoning 1335 Highway 1 West. Ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 0.53 acres of land located at 1335 Highway 1 West from intensive commercial to CL1. Uh, this is second consideration. Can I get a motion to um, consider it? So moved, Thomas. Second. Okay, council discussion. And I, I, I'm not sure if there's anyone in the public that would like to address this topic. If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Seeing none, council discussion. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Lee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Heeg? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. 9B Westside Estates, phase two subdivision. Resolution approving a preliminary plat of Westside Estates, phase two sub subdivision, a 13.10 acre subdivision consisting of 39 residential lots located north of Rowett Road, southwest and west of Yuma Drive. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved, Weiner. Second, Mims. All right, do we have a presentation by staff? Yes, Mary, I'd be happy to make one. If we could have the host or the city clerk enable screen sharing again, I do have some slides to show. I'm getting an error message that says it's disabled. There we go, just a sec.
Okay. This is a preliminary plat for land located in the yellow highlight here, just west of the uh, uh, west of 218 on Rarit Road. Um, this is a request by the Watts Group de uh, development for a single family uh, subdivision consisting of 38 single family lots and one out lot. The subject property shown here in the zoning map and here as the plat was previously platted in 2007 under a different name. Um, uh, that plat is, uh, expired due to inactivity uh, in 2019 and they're requesting essentially the same layout uh, to be replatted under a different name at this time. Um, as you can see here, the plat circled in yellow is an extension of the development that's occurred to the east of it, uh, including the street network and generally the layout of the lots. Again, as I said, this is essentially the same subdivision layout that was proposed two years ago. Um, and at that time in 2017, that good neighbor meeting was conducted. So in the review of preliminary plats, staff uses several criteria for review, including any conditional zoning agreement uh, stipulations that were placed on that, uh, approval for the rezoning, as well as the comprehensive plan and our subdivision and other ordinances. Um, the Conditions that were placed at the time of rezoning, uh, we have tracked the ones that have been met and are continuing to track the ones that are unmet. The unmet conditions are items that need to be fulfilled with the final plat after this stage and include a contribution of funds for road improvements. So as I said, staff does review the uh, components of the plat as well as conformance with the comprehensive plan. In this case, it continues to be in compliance with the comprehensive plan for the type and density proposed uh, when reviewed against the Southwest District Plan. Also, the streets and circulation are reviewed. Uh, this subdivision is providing connections internally through loop streets and externally to the neighborhood around it. Um, in the past, Royal Road has been improved to city standards within vicinity of this development. Um, there will be no additional improvements made to Rarit Road at this time. However, additional land is being dedicated by this developer to make way for future improvements uh, should they be necessary. Those improvements to Rarit Road would uh, be installed primarily on the uh, northern portion of the right-of-way. So keeping the southern right-of-way line as it is now and any improvements occurring within that right-of-way. We also evaluated open space and uh, have notified the developer of the requirement for open space. It can be met by fee and lieu. In this circumstance, we've also reviewed stormwater and, and infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, the developer will be required to pay 50% uh, of the cost of improving the street of Rorit Road uh, as they proceed through their final planning. So looking at this application in the context of the development process, we can see we're here at the blue highlighted stage which is the preliminary plat for the renamed subdivision. Um, and then they would go through a final plat uh, eventually after the preliminary plat is reviewed by you. The Planning and Zoning Commission did uh, vote four to three for, to approve this plat at their June 4th meeting. Staff did recommend approval based on a review of the relevant criteria. Um, there were comments received by the Planning Commission for the plat. Um, they largely had to do with the widening of the right of way for Rort Road and uh, additional information was provided at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to the folks in the community who had concerns about that, and they seemed satisfied at that time. Of course, they're always, always welcome to present their concerns to you again as well. So staff and the Planning Commission did recommend approval. That's my presentation. Mayor. I think you do need to unmute yourself. We're having fun with the Zoom tonight. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, any questions for staff, for Danielle? I just had one question. Uh, this is the first one that I've seen in my tenure on council where there's been kind of this delay of a few years from the prior steps in the process until now. Um, can you just talk a little bit about if, if you feel like that impacted this or, if, you know, I just want to make sure that like the people who were, would have received uh, notice at different stages did and if you have any concerns about that. I mean, it looks like that was pretty well vetted at the planning and zoning meeting based on their minutes, but if you could maybe just 
clarify sure. that. So as I mentioned, a good neighbor meeting was held in 2017 at the time of the Pratt, pre prelim plat under the other name. That was a totally voluntary step, which we highly encourage folks to do. Regardless of that, staff does send out a notice to property owners within a certain distance of the plat, letting them know there's going to be a meeting regardless so that the word gets out that uh, something is occurring. We did get a lot of feedback that people had gotten that uh, notice or had heard from folks that got that notice and had concerns. Um, that wanted more time to discuss it, but they were uh, aware of the project and did come to the Planning Commission meeting and, and make uh, known their concerns at that time. So there is a process, both voluntary and, and the uh, mailings that the city does to get the word out. Thank you. Great. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. We have John Arner, and please keep your comments to three to five minutes. Mr. Mayor, uh, John Marner with MMS Consultants. Uh, we're the civil engineering company that's been working with Watts Development Group on this on this uh, application for the preliminary plat. I think Danielle covered all of the comments and some of the things that we. Uh, come up during this preliminary plat process. Like she mentioned, it's a plat that was previously approved in 2017. Nothing has substantially changed from that original plat that was approved. It's the same number of lots, uh, same general street layout. It's got some smaller lots out to the front along Rare Road. Uh, we have dedicated, there were a few minor changes to the storm and sanitary, storm sewer and sanitary sewer uh, that we worked through those concerns with staff. Uh, to get those revisions incorporated as well. Uh, Rare Road, I know that conversation has come up as far as the additional right-of-way. All of that right-of-way is being dedicated on the north side of Rare Road for possible future uh, improvements by the city. I'd also point out that when the subdivision West Side Estates Phase 1 was completed to the east, a portion of Rare Road was improved at that time. Uh, if you if you note what took place at that time, we tried to maintain the south edge of the pavement and we shifted the center line of the road to the north and put all the improvements on the north side there as well. I, I can't speak for the city, but I believe the intent would be to do something similar to try and minimize the impacts on the south side of the road as much as possible. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think to address one of the questions from one of the council council members earlier, the subdivision was constructed in 20, or was started in 2017. They went ahead and built out phase one. Uh, the preliminary plat lapsed. The intent was always to go through, uh, to follow through and build phase two. It was just a timing issue. Uh, I think development's been moving along fairly well out there currently. You know, there's good schools out there. It's a nice area of town. It's a potential growth area for town uh, moving forward and, and they're ready to move forward with phase two. and and continue to put some more units out in that area. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, council discussion? It seemed that, that much of the concern um, brought up by petitioners to PNG to PNZ had to do with the what they would potentially do with Rarit, which sounds like it probably has been addressed now since he, they just said that this would be solely on the northern side instead of on the southern side. There also there there also seemed to be a fair number of concerns with respect to the timing. They wanted more time. They wanted the meeting postponed. <clears throat> but um, I'm not seeing that there would have been any great difference. This is Pauline, and I, I think it was noted at the PNZ meeting that uh, it was going to come before the council and that folks could speak before the council if they had still had those concerns. And it doesn't appear that we had any public that wanted to comment on this tonight. All right. Hearing no further discussion, roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Lee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Steve? 
Yes. Yes. Weiner. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. 9C, conditional use permit 3730, 3037 and 3031, IWV Row Southwest, a letter of recommendations of the Johnson County Board of Adjustment for an application submitted for a conditional use permit to allow for a commercial storage facility at 3037 and 3031, IWV Row Southwest and unincorporated Johnson County. Can I get a motion to approve? Taylor, so moved. Second, Mims. All right, we have presentation by staff. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, this is an application for a conditional use permit located in Johnson County, submitted by Nick Heeman for the uh, construction of a uh, commercial storage facility located in the yellow highlight here. For context, this is the zoning map, but purple area is Iowa City landfill and green area is agricultural zoning. Um, the subject property is located in our fringe area C, but outside of the city's growth boundary. Um, this agreement with the fringe area does allow for a review and comment by the city on this proposed uh, conditional use permit. Um, this is being heard by the uh, county's, uh, sorry, board of adjustment. So it's a little bit different process on their side, somewhat similar to our process that we go through with our board of uh, adjustment for uh, special exceptions. So uh, what we do when we review these fringe area agreements is consult with the comprehensive plan and the fringe area agreement itself. Um, this is as it is a component of the comprehensive plan that we've adopted. Um, so while the city's preference is to locate commercial land uses within the city of Iowa City limits, a conditional use permit is a little bit different than a rezoning. Uh, you've seen rezonings in the past where staff has taken the stance that a commercial rezoning is not appropriate. Conditional use permit is only changing the use for this one specific uh, thing to be constructed, not giving uh, the permission for all kinds of commercial development to, to occur. So it's a little bit more focused uh, analysis and does also, because this is a commercial development, include uh, the site plan review steps by the, count, by the county. So staff and in this instance is, uh, is um, comfortable with this particular proposed conditional use permit because of those factors making this uh, somewhat different than just a blanket rezoning of land outside of our growth boundary for commercial. Um, as I said, this is going before the county's board of adjustment. Uh, so the letter that you would submit would go to them for their uh, consideration as they proceed through this process. Um, they would do also a site plan review at the county level um, and the county does also have the ability to place the conditions they see fit for this development uh, as they would through their, through the, their um, consideration of the, con of the conditional use permit. So based on the analysis of the proposed project against the policies of our fringe area agreement, staff did recommend approval and at their June 4th meeting by a vote of seven to zero, the Planning and Zoning Commission also recommended approval. That concludes my staff report and I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions? Thank you, Danielle. Uh, it, would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand and I will call you by name. And if you're on the phone, press star nine to chime in. Uh, Sandy. Hi, this is Sandy Style with MMS Consultants. I'm John Marner's coworker that you just heard from. I'm representing Nick Heeman on the storage facilities that we're gonna do on IWV. I just wanna clarify for everybody, the term commercial is something we have to use because that's what's in the county ordinance. Um, these are going to be more or less for RV, boat storage, extra vehicles, they're not intended to ever be set up for commercial contractor bays or anything of that sort. And the added bonus for the, the two residential properties that are there is that this building will block some of the sights and smells from the landfill down to the southeast. So if you have any questions for me. Thank you for sharing, Sandy. Anyone else from the public like to address council? Uh, 
Seeing none, council discussion. Roll call, please. Delay. Yes. Taylor. Diamio Taylor. Yes. Sorry. He. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Weiner. Yes. Fergus. Yes. Mims. Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item 10, public hearing to authorize conveyance East Market Street to the University of Iowa. Resolution authorizing the conveyance of approximately 0 0.20 acres of land located on East Market Street between North Dubuque and North Clinton Streets to the University of Iowa. I'm gonna open the public hearing and staff presentation. Thank you, Mayor. This is Ann Russett with Neighborhood and Development Services. I have a presentation I'll share here. So as the Mayor mentioned, this is an item to consider a conveyance of city-owned land on East Market Street to the University of Iowa in order to preserve the Sansa Gilmore House. I'd like to provide a little bit of background on this item. Um, because there is a bit of history to this. In 2018, the Day Lutheran Church sold the San Jose Gilmore House to the university. And after that change in ownership, there were many concerns regarding the future of the building. There were particularly concerns regarding the demolition of the building. Because of those concerns, staff along with former members of the Historic Preservation Commission analyzed potential, potential sites where the San Jose Gilmore House could be relocated. And based on that analysis, the vacant lot across the street from the San Jose Gilmore House was identified as the most appropriate site for relocation. Um, and I have, a, I have a map here I'll share shortly. Um, in addition to that, staff secured a grant to assess the structure of the home. And the final report concluded that the building could be moved and rehabilitated. Since that report was finalized, staff worked with the university to identify potential solutions to preserve the building. And staff has reached an agreement with the university to move the building to the city on lot, which is across the street. And that's the agreement before the, the, the council tonight. Here's a picture of the San Jose Gilmer House. It's located at 109 East Market Street. It was built in 1843. It's the oldest known residence that remains in the city of Iowa City. Here's a map that shows the location of the San Jose Gilmore House with the red star. And uh, across the street identified in white is the city owned lot. So to summarize the draft agreement, um, the city would give the, give the to the university to preserve the San Jose Gilmore House and the university would be, be responsible for relocating the home and include all consultant costs. Any costs associated with that move would be the university's. They would also be responsible for re remodeling the house, keeping the Secretary of Interior standards in mind. And lastly, they'd be responsible for the maintenance and preservation of the home with sensitivity to the age, architecture, and historic nature for a minimum of 40 years. And if the university no longer has a use for the home within that 40 year period, the home would revert to city ownership. And after that 40 year period, the university would either preserve the home on site or at, on another suitable property. This item was discussed at the Historic Preservation Commission's main meeting. There were some representatives um, up in the community that came to speak on this item. There were representatives from the Hillel House, which is on the property just to the east of the city owned lot on East Market Street. They did express some concerns and had some questions regarding the university's plan. Um, it's my understanding that the university and the Hello House have since um, been in contact to, to uh, address any of those concerns. There was also a representative of the Friends of Historic Preservation that spoke in support of the agreement. 
And then lastly, the, the commission requested that the city look at creative ways to address parking in this area, particularly for religious institutions. Lastly, um, the HPC did recommend that the city council authorize execution of this agreement. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Do you know how much it costs uh, to move the house? I, I, we have estimates on that, but we don't, we don't have uh, an actual amount at this uh, point. How much the estimate? Um, I would have to look that up. Okay. And uh, they moving it because they want to build something else on that area or what the reason? That's correct. Hmm. Do you know exactly what's going to be built there? I do not. And and is that something as uh, we'll open up the public hearing while well, it is already open, we'll get public discussion. Is that something you can give for uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, potentially when we come back to speak? The estimates? Yes. Yeah, I can look at that now. Okay. All right. Um, any more questions for staff from council? Um, quick question. Is it, will, if we're, if we would be conveying the, the lot, does that, even though the lot is probably larger than the house itself, will, will any parking be preserved or will the whole lot um, simply be used for the house? There will be, I believe, some spaces for parking, but it may be for the proposed use that the university has. That may be a, a better question for the university. I don't know if they have um, a plan in place, a site plan based on the size of the, the San St. Gilmer house. But I think uh, to, yeah, to Councilor Giannis' uh, question, if we're giving away the whole land, that's it, period. They can use the whole thing as long as we are approving the whole land. So it will be university used. Correct. Any other staff questions? Hearing none, public discussion. If there's anyone from the public that would like to address this topic, I'm gonna to ask that you keep your comments to no more than three to, um, I'm seeing hands going up, so there could be quite a few. I'm gonna ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. And I am going to start with, uh, Gina Lee, followed by Kevin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gina Lee Swain. I'm currently the board president of the Friends of Historic Preservation and formerly the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. When a city council and a community are squarely facing racial inequities amidst a pandemic, one might well ask, how is important is leaving another old house? The St. St. Gilmar House was built in 1843 when Iowa was still a territory, not yet a state. Iowa's population then included 172, quote, free colored and 16, quote, slaves. The next year, only two blocks from this house, a constitutional convention met in the half-finished stone capital. A few delegates spoke up for equal rights, but Iowa's discriminatory black code prevailed. That is how old this house is, when enslaved people lived in Iowa, when old capital was still being finished, when the University of Iowa existed only on paper. This house symbolizes our earliest years as we first undertook the long, hard, and ongoing work of building a community. Tonight, almost 180 years later, please support the City University Agreement. This is a sound solution for these reasons. First, location. 
Although we preservationists wish the house could remain where it is, across the street can also work. And I want to emphasize that moving the house is a cost that the, under the university will cover. Yes, up to 24 parking spaces will be lost on this one-fifth of an acre. The problem of parking may always face us. However, the opportunity of saving the oldest house in the original town is before us now and should not be squandered. Reason two, preservation standards. The U of I will consult such standards for any outside work or inside renovation. Reason three, adaptive reuse. The university agrees not only to save the building, but also to use it. This aligns with preservation goals who don't believe old buildings should be just mothballed. And it makes economic and environmental sense. Adding the Sangsai Gilmore House to the campus enriches those who will use it and those who will walk by enjoying its architecture and sensing its history. And finally, reason four, the future. The U of I agrees to at least 40 years of stewardship of this house. Under this agreement, by 2060, 40 years from us, from now, some of us will be gone. Certainly I will be gone but not this fine building. Please vote yes, and thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Kevin Boyd, followed by Nicholas. So I had to unmute myself. Uh, Kevin Boyd, 622 North Van Buren. Uh, uh, others will likely, uh, generally has already kind of shared this, the history of the structure and it's included in your council packet, but I, I wanna to speak to two additional reasons why you should approve this agreement. First, uh, the agreement before you is really success in government cooperation and collaboration. Preserving this oldest uh, residential structure has been a priority for, for the Historic Preservation Commission since before I, or shortly after I joined. Lots of ideas and iterations have been expressed and shared through conversations between the previous owner, potential owners, interested citizens, the commission, the previous council, um, but particularly the university and especially the city staff. Um, those last two have really worked hard to find a solution here um, and, and I wanna commend them for that work. And before you tonight, uh, council members, as the results of that hard work, um, it, you have a solution before you to approve and I encourage you to do so. Second, if approved, this will be the third project um, with sig significant city leadership where a structure has been preserved and used for a different purpose than it was built. Examples of adaptive reuse are important as we think about climate change and how to minimize construction waste and value the embodied energy and structures. So uh, I, I just, I thank you for your time and consideration and I urge you to support this agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Hi, I just wanted to add a brief comment. I'm not really going to speak one way or the other as to whether or not council should approve this measure. I would just like to add a little context, namely the fact that uh, this council and city in general have a really quite terrible history of simply giving away prime real estate for purposes, for basically for others to use. Now, bear in mind, this is a far more, I guess you could say, this project has far more public benefit than say like giving away public land to build a luxury apartment complex. But at the same time, I recall it was no less than two years ago. In fact, it was probably just two years ago that city staff and council members were going on and on and on about the importance of land banking and how important land banking is that the city needs to preserve land for future public uses. And now that seems to have just gone poof. So I guess, I don't know, I'm really confused by what exactly council is doing. Do you just like come up with these decisions completely ad hoc now? Like there's no real planning here. It's like you're just giving it away. You're giving it to the university. The university actually owns a lot of undeveloped land. So again, I'm not speaking for or against, but I'm curious as to why the city has to give the university land for this. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? All right, Susanna. Yeah, I, it sure would be wonderful if there was something in there about um, 
university groups um, that had members with um, people of color could use that house for special occasions or when their family <laughs> visited or I'm not sure, but I just hope that there's a plaque that really shares that history and that pe I hope we see a lot of people of color going in and out of that house. Um, I think that's real important. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Joshua? Sorry, is this working? Yes, we can hear you. All right. I uh, just wanted to, uh, my name is Josh Moe, I live at 1036 Woodlawn Avenue, and I'm on the board of Friends of Historic Preservation. And um, as most of you know, we've been advocating to save this house for years. And I just wanted to thank you all for staying the course and staying with the many, many, many challenging changes that have happened throughout the possible uh, relocation of this house or saving of this house. And I think this is a good plan. I urge you to vote for it. And uh, as a response to a previous person um, discussing land banking, I think the reason the city of Iowa City land banks is for exactly this reason, so that we have the space to preserve resources for our community. And uh, this is just so fortunate that there is a location so close to its existing place and such an appropriate place to locate this house and something that'll really be an asset, even though it will be a university property for a period of time, it'll really be an asset to our community. So thank you. And again, I urge you to vote yes on this. Thank you. It, would anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, I am going to close the public hearing. Or, yep. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved, Mims. Seconded by Burgess. Motion to approve by the resolution by um, Mims and then Burgess. And Council discussion. I'll just say, this is Susan. I, uh, I will just say that I have found this project to be, um, I guess, problematic, <laughs> concerning. There's so many conflicts here with different things. Um, giving up these parking spaces um, in, that, are, that are greatly needed, um, but the need to preserve um, an incredibly important um, old house within the community. And so I, I you know, I have wished it could have stayed where it was. I wish that not being the case that we could have found um, a different um, and maybe better uh, close by location. I know staff looked at all different kinds of locations, but the distance, the cost, there are all kinds of logistics, et cetera. So I will support this, um, but I have to say it's, it's, <laughs> In some ways, it's not a wholehearted support because I'm really concerned about the other issues in terms of giving up um, a valuable piece of city property and giving up that parking. Um, but given the options, um, I am going to come down on the side of preserving this important house. Uh, this is John, and I, I'm also supportive of the project and, um, you know, do want to thank all the folks over the last several years who have contributed to the effort to um, to achieve this preservation. Uh, and I, I have to say there was a point in the process when we got some uh, cost estimates for the relocation and the rehabilitation, which as I recall were roughly $650,000. Um, it didn't look good. Um, so I'm extremely grateful that the university has partnered with the city on coming up with a concept and a way of making this happen. Uh, this is a very significant historic building. And as we've mentioned, the fact that it will be serving a purpose uh, and remaining more or less in the same location, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful old building. It will strengthen that particular part of town as, as we move forward in history here. Uh, I think it will 
serve in, in that way as a kind of a catalyst, uh, potentially, for future development in that general location. Uh, I, I think there are options with the parking uh, that can be explored. Um, so I, I, I'm optimistic that we can resolve the, the parking issues as well. This is Paul. Uh, okay, um, I just wanted to uh, echo what John had said and, and Susan. This has been, it seemed like a very long uh, process for this project. So it's, it's really uh, pleasing to see it come to a final resolution and I will be supportive of this. My question is more, is, is this maybe an object lesson for the importance of, of protecting buildings early on through historic preservation and historic preservation overlay because would, I mean, I'm going to end up voting for this, but would we be in this position if the, if the how if the Sanctuary Saint Gilmore house had been protected and therefore the, the what would the university have been allowed to even consider tearing it down? That probably shows my ignorance on historic preservation, but I'm really wondering if that, if that, if it turns, if it really is an object lesson, yes, we've come to this agreement, but had things been different a couple of years ago or several years ago before, um, before it was sold to the university, what would be the outcome? I'm also supportive of this, um, this agreement with the university. I had some hesitations um, based on the, the fact that this is valuable city property um, but I also agree that the agreement makes sure that this building will be used. And the city's plan, you know, a couple of years ago when we were looking at the possibility of, of moving it ourselves and then just mothballing it, not only was very, very expensive in terms of the upfront cost, but really didn't provide for a, a plan for continued use of the property. So the fact that the university through this agreement is obligated to um, maintain the property and if they don't use the property, it reverts to the city and the fact that the, they will be remodeling it as well as um, in the process when, after they move it. So it's not just sitting mothballed. Um, that was really significant to me that, that um, adaptive reuse for whatever, um, whatever it will hold for the future and many decades to come. Okay, I, I just wanna say my comment is not by any means to the Historic Preservation Commission or the friend of the Historic Preservation. Uh, my comment actually to the council member and the citizen. Uh, I guess for the, for the commission and for the friend of the Historic Preservation, I wanna say I understand the importance of preserving the first house in Iowa City. That's very important. I understand that. There's no problem on that. And I'm gonna ending Yes, to make you feel better, I will end voting yes for that. But I have to say this, you know, I just wanna, I have a concern. We always, by giving like 1 million, uh, you know, uh, a land that worth 1 million, just like that, with a little conversation to the University of Iowa. And when it come to affordable housing, it takes us forever to approve, to increase uh, from 600 to 1 million, it took us a long time to do so. And now we're giving away a land worth 1 million with a little conversation. This is really, uh, in, it's just like ridiculous to me. And we need to do more toward affordable housing as Nicole said. He said the area one million is nothing. Yes, one million is nothing because I see how you give it away like that. For this is really one million nothing. But for affordable housing things, we need more than one million. That's true. But we need really to have a serious conversation, even just to add the word plan, create plan for affordable housing on the strategic plan. It takes us forever and you guys decide not to add the word plan. You know. Just think about this. When it comes, if I, if I, if there is no no solution for housing the homeless or preserving the you know this house, giving one million to preserve this house or house a homeless, of course I'm gonna choose, like choose housing the the homeless. Just you know, sometimes I just feel like 
we are doing some stuff that like make me uh, just think how we think, uh, how, what is the priority? What's the need and what's the want in this city? But the, the, the fact that the people who need the affordable housing, they are not here to, to advocate for it because they work too job to make and meet because they don't have time to be on this kind of meeting so if they can advocate. And my advice to the, you know, the hysteric preservation friend, yes, advocate for that and come out also and advocate for affordable housing for those people because those people cannot be here. We always, we, we struggle doing affordable housing for a long town, time, even though I know every single council are very passionate about affordable housing. I, I know that. But they're very, you know, like uh, cautious to really act immediately on this issue because we don't see the people here and say, hey, we want this. We are suffering. We are dying. We don't have houses. We are homeless. We don't see those people come to the council meeting. We see the people who came for, for to, you know, to reserve for historic preservation, for animals, for trees, for every single things. Because those people, they don't need houses. They already living very good life. They have very good income. They don't need to go and work too. People, they have time to come and advocate for this stuff. I'm not saying this is not important. It is important, but to me, as a council member, is a priority. What come first? I will be supportive of this, but hopefully we need to have a serious conversation about affordable housing, especially during this time for Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Well, how do I follow that? <laughs> Afford, I, I, I'll second it. Affordable housing, I think uh, you said it best. I did want to make sure that uh, Ann Russ had had an opportunity um, if you have the answer to Mayor Pro Tem's question. I do. Um, so these estimates were done over a year ago, so I just want to qualify it. Um, the building relocation estimate that we had was almost $242,000. Um, that does not include uh, the rehabilitation and the adaptive reuse of that structure, that, that was around 662,000. Those costs will be the university's costs. Yeah, I guess ask you that question because um, I saw if we keep our parking lot and if the university donate the house, we can move in and it's still at the end of the day, the whole parking lot is us, is ours, and the university building is ours. You know, that's what I was thinking. We can pay for the move and have our, put it on our land. And, uh, you know, that was just an option. But I don't know. This is, it seemed like done deal. And I, my vote is nothing. It's only one. <laughs> I have a question, um, actually, for anyone that knows this. Um, if after the 40 years, the university has no use for the, the, the house, does the house revert back to the city and the land, or is it just the house only? It's the house and the land. It's the land that's being sold. The, the house will become a, a, a fixture on the, the land. Okay. All right. Um, I think, you know, the comments that people have made about the house, I think is quite important to talk about preserving this house in particular uh, because of, it's the original house. So I, I find great value in, in doing that. Um, I am not a fan of, um, you know, giving up the lot at this juncture. Um, you know, I wish we had opportunity to navigate other things, but <clears throat> I think we did have an opportunity last year and we kind of, um, kind of, didn't didn't act on it. I am going to support this tonight, but I also have to say that we have opportunity um, moving forward through action at moving quickly on other things that are human right related within our community. Um, and I hope that our council does act just as fast when we're acting on something like this tonight. So um, I'm going to be supportive of it. Any other comments? 
Hearing none. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Motion. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved, ma'am. Sorry. Second. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Evans? Yes. Lee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 11, library parking. Ordinance amended in Title IX entitled Motor Vehicles and Traffic, Chapter 4, entitled Parking Regulations to Facilitate Library Curbside Service. First consideration, could I get a motion for it? So move, Weiner. Second, Thomas. All right, can we have presentation by staff? Thanks for having me here tonight. Um, the library started curbside pickup on June 4th as part of our phased reopening. It's going really well. Um, the, the plan seems to be working. Um, so far, we've served about 400 people through curbside pickup, and almost 2,000 items have been distributed through that and postal mail. Obviously, a key part of curbside service is having parking available for folks coming in to retrieve their materials. And we're requesting the change from our parking spots to go from 20 to 10 minutes, just to facilitate that quick turnover of curbside um, pickup time. We anticipate expanding the, the hours of curbside as we move closer to a full reopening. And we're asking for this to be from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, Monday through Saturday. Um, and at that, when the library fully reopened, we would anticipate um, reverting back to the 20 minute spots to allow people to come into the building. With the 20 minute spots, um, now people are more inclined to park and then do other downtown business, um, thinking that, that they'll have time to run out and do an errand and come back. So that's the request that we're making. Does anyone have any questions? That's good. My question is, like, the people will ask you for the name of the book and how, how that, and you go and give them, or how that work? That's a great question. So this is done by appointment. Um, we start with the first rollout was only for people who had holds already placed when the library okay. was closed. We've now been moved into accepting new holds. So you place a hold when you get your notice that gives you all the details of how okay. to schedule an appointment and then how the process works. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Ellsworth. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing none, council discussion? Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Lee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Lee. Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item 12, adoption of City Council 2020 to 2021 strategic plan. Resolution adopted Iowa City 2021, uh, 2020 through 2021 strategic plan priorities. Did I get a motion to approve the resolution? Thomas? Second by Mims. Mims, all right. Staff presentation? Certainly. Um, hello, Council. Good evening. I am Ashley Monroe, Assistant City Manager. Uh, so tonight's resolution will adopt the 2020 2021 strategic plan priorities. Uh, Council began this process in early March of this year and uh, summarized your, your priorities and current issues 
and resulted in seven uh, objectives. They were modified slightly from the prior strategic plan and I'll just highlight the, the main ideas of these strategic plan objectives and answer any questions. So the seven objectives contained in your strategic plan will include advanced social justice, racial equity, and human rights, demonstrate leadership and climate action, strengthen community engagement and intergovernmental relations, invest in public infrastructure, facilities, and fiscal reserves, foster healthy neighborhoods and affordable housing throughout the city, enhance community mobility for all residents, and promote an inclusive and resilient economy throughout the city. Um, this final uh, strategic objective um, resulted in the need for us to, to put it in the late packet, um, just missed a copy and paste when creating the resolution. So I'll take any questions that you have um, about adopting the plan. I is this us we can talk now or um, you can ask uh, questions yes I just want you to read it again because I really would like to propose before you approve this since uh, later tonight we're going to uh, have a resolution and in that, in number two on the resolution, we're saying creation of new affordable housing plan. I would like to suggest we add this to this strategic plan where we was talking about adding the word plan and last time. If you can read that part and see, I don't know how can we add this without, before approve it. I, I really don't know, but that's my, my suggestion. Okay, so if I understand, you just want me to repeat um, the the section header that says foster healthy neighborhoods and affordable housing throughout the city. Um, and that, only the section where you say yes. the creation plan. Um, so then the the one sub sub. Um, objective is to identify new efforts to expand and adapt the city's affordable housing and neighborhood improvement strategies to meet long-term needs throughout the community. That was what was discussed in the in the meeting. Yeah, I know that. That's why I'm, I'm just asking if the council ab uh, agrees since we have this anyway on the resolution that we're going to pass tonight and you have that sentence say creation of new affordable housing plan why we don't add this to the strategic plan i know that that was something that i um uh, did talk about at the at, at our last meeting uh adding that word plan and what that really means um where we're not where, where we really do look in depth into what we're doing for affordable housing and because we have some things over here, some things over here, which we will probably continue. But if you have more of a solid plan, a comprehensive plan, I think that there's there'll be more conversation that a guide our future acts with uh, with tax dollars, so that we can really be informed of how we're going to combat affordable housing within our community. So I am fully supportive of adding the word plan. Is this, are we asking questions of um, staff or are we talking among each other now? And, yes, and actually I, you're, you're exactly correct. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold further comments amongst us um, after we have public discussion. Thank you for that okay. correction. Thank you. All right. Um, if no other further staff questions, then I'm gonna ask anyone from the public uh, to address this topic. And I see Megan. And please keep your comments to no more than uh, three to five minutes. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Megan Marcello. I am at 2916 Sweetbriar. I just wanted to uh, ask uh, whether 
this is the appropriate time to vote on this adopting this resolution considering the special meeting later tonight and two of the two of the points that are in this strategic plan and seem to be directly impacted by or could be by community feedback at seven o'clock including the advanced advancement of social justice racial equality human rights uh, as well as the strengthening community engagement and intergovernmental relations and it seems to me that passing this prior to the community discussion at seven um, could indicate or at least would perhaps indicate to me um, a show of bad faith and just not getting off to a good start um, for the discussion at seven and that's it. Thank you. And we have Madonna. Hello, uh, my name is Madonna White. I live at 125 Taft Speedway. I think the council needs to be applauded for the fact that you'll, you put this strategic plan together in March and you are addressing highly uh, relevant issues in your strategic plan and that is what this is is a strategic plan tonight's special meeting is hoping to address two of the items that you're listing in your strategic plan but i think the way the strategic plan is laid out is superb thank you very much thank you madonna anyone else like to address this topic Seeing no one, council discussion. Um, with respect to, to adding the word plan, Maz, are you talking about adding it into the header, FOSTI, um, foster healthy neighborhoods and affordable housing throughout the city or into the, into the first bullet under that, identifying new efforts to expand and adapt the city's affordable housing? Yeah, on the bullet, you know, yes. yes, yeah. Because if we're talking about amending what you could just replace identify with plan. You know, I really don't you know, remember the wording now, but I remember last time we're trying to do it, but uh, it wasn't like kind of agreement. But now you are, you are, we have on the resolution coming tonight that we want to be serious about it. And we said that we're going to have creation of new affordable housing plan. Then if we put that in our strategic plan for the for next year, that means that's really look serious, I guess. And now we need to add that. Well, I guess, actually, can you give us like some uh, like sentence if you can add the word plan and see how it look like so that people you know you can give them idea. I think Council I mean, Carolina's suggestion would be fine. You could swap identify with plan, and we we would move forward with with the understanding that the council desires a plan. So, so Maz, the, the sentence would read, if you change that one verb out, it would read, plan new efforts to expand and adapt city's affordable housing and neighborhood improvement strategies to meet long-term needs throughout the community. Mm, no. What about if we would plan on the head, uh, like affordable housing plan? on the header. Well, uh, oh, the, way I, the way I'm reading this, Maz, uh, inserting plan there wouldn't make as much grammatical sense as the way in which uh, Janice is suggesting to do it. To say affordable housing plan is, is a different use of the word plan um, than I think we're the language in that header is, is structured. Okay, hold on. What I really want is creation. Like we have create a solid, like a solid affordable housing plan. Like 
we need to know that we we need to figure out a plan for affordable housing and we we will work of course you know the details is later because we can work with another like uh, organization who care about affordable housing such as habitat such as like affordable housing coalition all those people maybe they can come together later and come out with a plan but like a, a serious plan to for this because every year we have something here something they are 10 percent for 10 years and we have like uh, those small stuff of affordable housing but what i mean when i say plan we need to plan out like a big project for affordable housing is spending a lot of money maybe borrow money bond for affordable housing like we bond for the bed mall we bond for everything if we don't have money we can just bond for it like you know borrow money for it that's what i mean that we we need at least the meaning of that just come up with the language that's what i really mean uh, this is pauline <laughs> i think i, I liked uh Councilor Weiner's uh, suggestion that plan fits best in that first bullet and rather than identify. And then I do like that uh, Mazahir about adding create plan and create because we could plan till forever, but we actually need to create also. So I think I like your suggestion plan and create new efforts to expand and adapt the city's affordable housing. I, I would agree with that. Yes, create. Yes, that's what makes sense to me too. <laughs> well, I mean, if it could, um, it's sort of a little bit odd to be uh, but you could say cre create a new plan to expand and adapt the city's affordable housing. Can I make a suggestion? Okay. How about identify new efforts to expand and adapt the city's affordable housing plan and neighborhood improvement strategies, et cetera? I think that's I, I like that so that we actually have the word plan in there as our mayor pro tem is advocating for, but also it's it's saying here's where we are now and we need to expand on on that. I think that's a good way to word it. And I think especially since we have a few um, things in the work, such as the South District, um, the University City, you know, kind of just looking at all of that um, broad picture and trying to figure out solutions and, and, and new things moving forward. So um, I think that does meet uh, the intent of what we're, what we're wanting to do as a council. I think that makes sense. I like Eleanor's suggestion. I mean, we have an affordable housing plan, but basically we've accomplished like 14 of the 15 steps. So it's obviously time to update, um, add new steps as we move forward. And I think that would get the word plan in there as uh, Mazahir wants and um, indicate that we're not just going to pick projects here and there, but we're gonna develop a long-term plan once again um, that will probably encompass a lot of things we're already doing, but possibly look at new and additional um, projects that we haven't thought about yet. Yeah, I, I think it's okay. funny. I, I, you know, I always view the affordable housing plan as a working document, which we're constantly expanding and revising as we move forward. So, yeah, that seems fine. Okay, then let's um, withdraw the motion and restate, if that's what you're wanting to do, and restate the motion to um, add the word plan to the, that first bullet after affordable housing. Let me get a second. Is there anybody that would like to redraw the, the previous motion? Who made the original motion? They have to withdraw it, don't they? Yes. So um, that would Kelly, who made it? Thomas. Okay, I will withdraw it. Okay. And can I get a second? You don't need a withdraw. You don't need a second right. for the withdrawal. I think we just okay. need a new motion. All right. To adopt the plan as amended by this discussion to add the word plan in the first bullet under foster healthy neighborhoods and affordable housing throughout the city. And you can just say so moved and get a second. I moved by Mims. Second by Sally. All right. Any council discussion? I, the only thing I want to say, 
yeah, thank you for being patient and doing that. This is great. And uh, the, the second thing is, I think we are, our understanding now, and we will be serious about this, we really want to create a plan to try to solve the affordable housing, you know, regardless what the language is. But, you know, that's the notion of this. And thank you again. Any other discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Fergus? Yes. Jims? Yes. Lee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 13, council appointments. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. So 13A, Historic Preservation Commission, um, one vacancy to fill a three-year term, July 1st through 2020, um, July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. Council discussion on this item. Could I get a motion? Well, let's, yeah, let's talk about this item. Um, and I, typically we might talk about 13A and 13B together. Um, but I think we'll do 13A separately today. I was just going to say there's one, uh, one applicant, a male, and the requirement for gender balance is a male. And I think Carl Brown uh, would certainly meet the qualifications that we would want on that commission. So um, I would nominate Carl Brown for that. This is Pauline. I, I, I agree. I believe he lives in the Longfellow district. Yeah, he's on Sheridan, so he should be. Yes. Any other discussion on that item or? It... Are people, all right, so uh, we had Councillor Mims make the motion and I'm gonna, uh, um, Councillor Taylor second it. Roll call please. Fergus? Yes. Mims? Yes. Lee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item 13B, telecommunica Telecommunications Commission. Two vacancies to fill a three-year term, July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. And this one it's two vacant, there's two vacancies, um, one female and one none. So I do wonder what are thoughts here? We could kind of delay the appointment and wait until we get a, another applicant. Well, James Pierce, I think is qualified. He's been on before and he could fill the one that doesn't matter on genders. So I guess I would suggest that we move forward with that appointment. We can appoint a female when we get a female applicant. Okay. This is Pauline I agree. So we have a, a motion by uh, to appoint James Pierce by uh, Councillor Mims, seconded by Councillor Taylor. Any discussion? And I know James, I think he'll do a great job. I, I mean, I, yep. Okay. Any other, any other discussion? All right, we'll do roll call, wait. So I also wanna do, well, we'll delay the appointment for the second because they're not there anyway. So, um, so we'll do a, a motion, um, roll call please for James Pierce. Mims? Yes. Lee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Fergus. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. And we will keep um, that other vacancy will remain open until it is filled. Item number 14. This is announcements of vacancies new. Planning and Zoning Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through June 30th, 2023. 
Applications must be received by 5 p.m. July 28th, 2020. And. Mayor, can we get a motion to accept correspondence? Yes. Um, can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So move, so Weiner. Second, Sally. Move by Weiner, seconded by Sally. Uh, roll call, please. Asali? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Fergus? Yes. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item 15. Announcements of vacancies previous. Public Art Advisory Committee. Two vacancies to fill a three-year term. July 1st through um, July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment. One vacancy to fill a five-year term. Historic Preservation Commission. One vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. And we are on to item number 16. Um, and we're gonna hear from Ryan Longdecker with UISG. Hi, Council. Um, don't have too much tonight. Uh, to, um, kind of everyone at the university is waiting for tomorrow. Um, UIO plans to announce their fall COVID-19 um, plan for returning students to campus. Um, and Iowa State and UNI already announced theirs. It looks as though Iowa will um, start August 24th. Um, that is seems to be pre set in stone and will not be um, moving earlier like uh, Iowa State and UNI. Um, what's currently unknown right now to students and what we're hoping for tomorrow is an announcement about what will happen between Thanksgiving and um, winter break, uh, whether we will be brought back in person, whether it will be virtual. Um, so that's kind of one of the big things that students are waiting for now. Um, and outside that, I really don't have anything. Um, tonight at the 7 p.m. meeting, I plan to um, let others speak from the community. Um, I think, you know, I've made um, statements to you and USG has made its positions pretty clear um, that we're supportive of protesters and we are supportive of Black Lives Matter and we are supportive of, um, you know, changes in our community and progressing forward as a community together um, to battle racial injustices. And so um, all that I will offer uh, tonight is just that I encourage you to really listen um, to the people that are coming to speak tonight from our community and um, to listen to them tonight and outside of council, because this is obviously going to be a, a, not a, a one week thing. This will be, you know, um, months, if, if not years of um, work to um, tear down these racial institutions and, and make these fixes. So um, that's all that I have tonight. And um, thank you for all your work that you're doing. Thank you, Ryan. All right. And moving on to City Council updates. Any meetings or community events you want to talk about? Um, there's a JEC meeting tomorrow afternoon at two for the first time since I've been on council. So it's by, by Zoom. They, I guess they've been a little busy out there for the first few months of the year. So it'll be interesting I have to to uh, report back at our next meeting. I'll just mention, I'll just mention on, the, hello. on the lighter side, uh, baseball is all. All right. And I know that um, tonight at 7 p.m. we do have another meeting and encouraging the public to uh, tune in to that meeting and be a part as well. Um, I know that many of us have been um, really um, contemplating uh, the meeting tonight, have been in a lot of conversations. And so um, 
yeah, invite people back at 7 p.m. tonight. Hearing nothing else, any um, updates from our city manager? No updates tonight, Mayor. And Ashley Monroe, our assistant city manager? Nothing tonight, thank you. And our city attorney, Eleanor? Nothing for me, thanks. And Kelly, our city clerk? Nothing for me either. All right, if nothing else for the good of the cause today, can I get a motion to adjourn? Taylor, so moved. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, we are adjourned until um, our next meeting at 7 p.m. See you soon. See you soon.